Namaste and a very, very good morning to all of you. I welcome you to my channel, The Outlier. My name is Mithun. In today's video, I'll be talking about how to build a recommendation engine using R Studio. I repeat, how do we build a recommendation engine using R Studio? Even before I proceed to demonstrate how to build a recommendation engine in R Studio, may I request you to subscribe to my channel, also like and share my videos. Let's begin by asking a simple question. What exactly is a recommendation engine? Why do we need to build a recommendation engine? What are the typical problems that are associated with a recommendation engine? And what are the advantages of building a recommendation engine? Let me give you a few examples in our daily life. Let's say in the coming weekend, you want to watch a movie. And there are multiple movies in the theater. So you're slightly confused which movie should you watch. At the end of the day, nobody wants to watch a bad movie, waste his time, waste his money, come back home upset. It's, it's just that you have one Sunday and you want to make the best of this particular weekend. Let's assume for the purpose of this discussion that there are five movies which are playing in the theater. It could be RRR, it could be a movie like Kantara, it could be Mission Impossible, it could be Rambo, or it could be Rocky. These are the five movies. Which of these five movies should you watch? This is a question in your mind. How do you answer this question? Typically, you take the opinion of your friends, your family, your relatives, or perhaps your neighbors. If your neighbors recommend saying that, yes, there's a movie called as Kantara and it's an excellent movie. The special effects is wonderful. The climax is really, really thrilling. And the hero has done an excellent job of, uh, of, 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 uh, of acting in this particular movie. What do you do? You tend to go and buy the tickets of Kantara. So in this case, what you've done is basically to choose one of the movies be out of the five movies based on somebody's recommendation. Recommendation with double quotes. Human mind is very, very susceptible. Our psychology is such that we tend to act as per people's recommendation. If people recommend one movie ahead of others, you tend to go and watch that particular movie. Let us say you ask your colleagues which movie is the best. And let's say 80% of them say Mission Impossible is a very, very interesting movie. So next time, because 80% of the people suggest a movie, you tend to watch this particular movie. Here again, a recommendation has a huge impact on your psychology and you tend to choose a particular movie. You tend to consider a particular movie over and above the rest of the movies simply because it has been recommended by a few people. Let me give you a second example. Let's say you have a child at home and you need to get him admitted to a school. There may be multiple schools. You may have Delhi Public School. You may have Sri Saraswati Vidya Mandir, St. Joseph's College. You may have Kumarans or Bishops. Now, out of these five schools, which school should you get your child admitted to? Should it be DPS or should it be St. Joseph's or should it be Kumarans? To answer this question, again, what do you do? you ask the neighbors in the apartment. In your apartment, when you inquire out of 10 neighbors, let's say eight of them say, yes, uh, Sri Saraswati Vidya Mandir is an excellent school. Uh, the teachers there are very, very good and very knowledgeable and they tend to uh, deliver wonderful uh, sessions. What do you do? The next thing that you do is to enroll your child in this particular school. Here again, what has played a huge part in your decision making is recommendations made by your colleagues or your neighbors in the apartment. I can give you the last example. Let's say you love reading. You like reading perhaps a lot of uh, murder mystery novels or thrillers. And you want to know which of the books in the market should you buy. There are let's say five or six books like uh, a Citraford Mystery by Agatha Christie or perhaps uh, there are other books by uh, Dan Brown, like uh, Angels and Demons, Inferno, Deception Point, Da Vinci Code. Now you want to see out of these five movies, which book, sorry, which book, not movie, but which out of these five books should you pick up? Again, what you do is you'd ask a friend 
out of these five books, which one is good and worthy of your time? If your friend recommends, let's say, Angels and Demons is a lovely book. It's very, very thrilling and exciting, and it's a must read. You tend to pick up Angels and Demons and read this particular book. In each of these cases, may it be movies, may it be enrolling your child in a school, or may it be buying a book. One of the one of the things which plays a big role is recommendations that have been made by people. Now, with this background, just think of online shopping, right? We tend to do a lot of online shopping, may it be in Flipkart or Amazon or in some of the other e-commerce platforms. There, when you get into Amazon website, typically there are certain suggestions that have been made. People who have bought this also have bought this, right? Uh, if you have bought a certain set of books in the past, based on your past buying behavior, they tend to make certain recommendations. Let's say I'm a big fan of Sylvester Stallone and I love watching Sylvester Stallone's movies like Rambo, Rocky, or it could be The Expendables. Now, because I have watched these series of movies, next time I watch, next time I get into Netflix, it tends to make a recommendation of Sylvester Stallone's movies or Arnold's movie. It could be Terminator or any of these things, right? Now, how does Amazon get to know that it should make this recommendation? At the back end, they have their own proprietary algorithms. And based on these proprietary algorithms, they study your past purchases. They study what are the movies that you have watched in the past. Uh, if you are a move, if you're a movie buff, and particularly your taste revolve around watching action movies, the next recommendation that you get by, Am uh, by Amazon Prime could be an action movie. If you are somebody who loves to watch, uh, let's say, Shah Rukh Khan's uh, romantic movies, it could be Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge, or it could be any of the other movies. The next time you get into Amazon Prime, they tend to make a recommendation of, uh, again, let's say some of these uh, old uh, old romantic movies uh, by Shah Rukh Khan, right? So in each of these things, what is happening is that there is an algorithm at the back end and these algorithms study your past purchases. They study your past purchases. The same thing works even in YouTube. Let's say you're a big fan of uh, Kishore Kumar songs and you've watched a series of Kishore Kumar songs. Next time, it may make a recommendation of Mohammad Rafi's songs to you. May it be YouTube, may it be Amazon Prime, may it be Flipkart, may it be any other online shopping platform. They study the past purchases, your historical behavior, and this acts like the data. The historical data is basically your past purchases, your past choices, and based on your past choices, they make a recommendation saying that the next good movie that you would like to watch is XYZ. So recommendation engines, uh, recommendation engine in today's day and age is becoming very, very powerful, particularly in the world of e-commerce. I repeat, particularly in the world of e-commerce, when you're into online shopping and such things, recommendation engines become very, very powerful. Now, when you're building a recommendation engine, typically there are three problems. The first problem is what is called as a long tail problem. So this is what is called as a long tail problem. The second problem is what is called as cold start problem. And the third problem that you, that you encounter while you build a recommendation engine is that you have huge data sparsity issue. These are some of the problems that you typically encounter when you build a recommendation engine. Now, what exactly is a long tail problem? Typically, let's say in the 1980s and the 1990s, if you were to go to a small shop which would sell only 20 or 30 products, it's pretty simple, it's pretty easy for the shopkeeper to make a recommendation to you because you have limited choice of products. Hardly 15, 20 products, let's say you have two kids, Based on uh, the fact that you have two kids, he may recommend, uh, let's say, uh, let's say a bat or a ball or let's say children comics and such things. 
Now, this is very, very simple. When you have 15, 20 products, all the items can be displayed and you can literally feel, touch these items and make a decision. But in today's day and age, when you have millions and millions of products, it becomes very, very difficult for the person to display all the products. Consider the fact that you have to buy a book. There may be millions of books. Can a person, can an e-commerce platform display all the books? Is it practically possible for you to read the cover page of each of these books and make a decision? No. When you have millions and millions of items, it becomes difficult for you to see all the items. Not all the items are visible. Not all the items are touchable. Not all the items you can actually feel. This is a typical problem that you see in an e-commerce space, which is called as a long tail problem. The second uh, problem that you see is what is called as cold start problem. There are three types of cold start problem. One is what is called as user cold start. The second one is what is called as item cold start. And the third one is what is called as a system cold start. When we say user cold start, let's go back to the discussion that we just now had. I said that usually these recommendation engines that are operating in Flipkart or Amazon, they study your past purchases. Let's say you're a sports buff and you have bought a cricket bat, a tennis racket, sports shoes, a t-shirt. Based on this, based on the choices that you've made in the past, it can make a recommendation of, let's say a tennis ball or a leather ball or any of these things next time you visit this platform. This is true when these algorithms can see your past purchases. Now, what happens for a completely new customer? When you are a completely new customer, the algorithm does not have any access to your past behavior. This is the first time you have come into Amazon or Flipkart and the algorithm has no way of finding what is your historical buying behavior. When we do not know what is your interest area, do you like both books? Do you like music? Do you like uh, do you like uh, buying uh, clothes? Are you into buying watches? We have absolutely no way of finding this because it's the first time you have landed on the page. It becomes very, very difficult for the algorithm to make a recommendation. And this problem is called as user cold start. Now, just as you have user cold start, you may also have what is called as item cold start. Item cold start is a case wherein, let's say, Apple has launched a new product. Now, there is no way you can compare this particular product with any other product because this is the first time people are even seeing this product. So since this product cannot be compared with any other product, it becomes very, very difficult to make a recommendation of this particular, particular product with some other product. This is called as item cold start. When a product is launched for the very first time or if it's a new product, making a recommendation of that particular product becomes very, very difficult. You have the third case, which is called as system cold start. So we have spoken about long tail problem, cold start problem. Now let me speak on the third issue here. And this is typical of e-commerce websites and such things. This problem is called as data sparsity issue. What is this data sparsity issue? Typically, when you're talking about any of these e-commerce platforms, you can you will see a lot of sparsity issue because imagine that there are 10,000 movies. There are 10,000 movies. If a person has given a rating, he would have rated 20 out of these 10,000 movies. Why? Simply because he might not have seen the rest of the movies. In your entire lifetime, maybe you may see, let's say, 50 movies. So it's possible for you to rate only these 50 movies. You cannot rate a movie which you have not seen. What will happen to those remaining movies? Out of 10,000 movies, you may have seen 50 movies and therefore you will rate only 50 movies. The balance 9,950 movies which you have not seen will be blank cases. So this is what is called as data sparsity. So again here, in this case, when you are dealing with recommendation engines, when you are talking about e-commerce data and such things, you will have tremendous levels of data sparsity. So these are some of the challenges that we typically see in a recommendation engine, long tail problem, cold start problem, and then you have what is called as data sparsity. So when you are confronted with these problems, 
it becomes difficult to build a model which is highly accurate. So recommendation engines, nobody is saying that your recommendation engines need to be 95% accurate or it should give you, let's say, 99% uh, accurate results. It may not happen in the real world that just because uh, online a platform makes a recommendation, the uh, the person or the customer will buy every recommendation that you make. He may not buy it. I remember there's a saying, something is better than nothing, right? Something is better than nothing. Instead of making a random recommendation, if you study the past purchases and then make a recommendation to the customer, there's a good chance that the customer buys this particular product even if the even if five percent of the people fall for the recommendation that you make netflix or your flipkart or amazon any of these online platforms would have made their share of money so this is how the entire business by and large works they their business thrives in recommend through recommendation engines so with this background let me proceed to show how do we build a recommendation engine in R Studio? As you can see here, this is the R Studio platform, but the codes that I'm going to uh, show here will work in R as well. Let me quickly show you some of the codes that we will be using in today's session. The first thing that we will have to do is simply load the package. The package that we will be using to build a recommendation engine is called as Recommender Lab. So you can see here in the second line of code, we're just using this command install.packages of Recommender Lab. Please remember this name. This is the name of the package in R Studio that you can use to run a recommendation engine. I've already installed this package, so I will not be install, installing this particular package once again. In the third line, I will be calling the library of Recommender Lab. You can see here, the Recommender Lab has been activated. Once you call the library, the functionalities that are present in this particular library will be made available to you. Now, let me go to line number five. In line number five, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to load the data. Now, the name of the data set that we will be using is called as movie lens data set. You can see here, this data set is inbuilt into recommender lab. Now, what I like to do is, let me load this particular data. I like to also show the website movie lens. So this is the movie lens website. You can see here, non-commercial personalized movie recommendations. If you scroll down here, you can see here, it displays a few movies. It could be Casablanca, Band of Brothers. It could be The Lives of Others, so on and so forth. Here you can just describe, uh, you can uh, read the description. It says recommendations. Movie Lens helps you find the movies you will like. So the job of this particular site is to help you find the movies that you like. Now to do this, you have to rate the movies. So this is the job that you have. Once you sign in, you have to basically rate the movies. Why? Because once you rate the movies, the algorithm will be able to build a custom taste profile, right? So let's say you've watched a lot of Shah Rukh Khan's movies. Let's say a lot of uh, DDLJ or it could be Dil To Pagal Hai or it could be any of... Uh, Shah Rukh Khan's movies, let's say 15, 20 movies you rate, then basically the algorithm understands, oh, this person is more into Shah Rukh Khan, Bollywood movies, maybe the next uh, romantic movie I could recommend to him, right? So it can build a custom taste profile based on the choices that you make. Then Movie Lens would recommend other movies for you to watch. So this is the job of the Movie Lens site. When you scroll down, you can see here there are a lot of movies, similar movies, it says, based on the choices that you make. Now, in our case, what is uh, interesting is that the recommender lab, the recommender lab that we are using already has the inbuilt movie lens data set. So let me go to R Studio. 
This is R Studio, and now I'll be using R Studio to load the data set. Let me execute this code once again. After executing this code, the next thing that I need to do is I will have to look at the data structure. Let me examine the data structure. How do I examine the data structure? It's pretty simple to examine the data structure. All that you need to do is you have to use the structure command. In line number eight, you can see here, let's look at the data structure. You can use the str command on movie lens. Then you have, when you look at the structure, initially, this is what you are able to see. R Studio displays the class of the object. It says this is real rating metrics under the package called as a recommender lab. There are two slots here. One is the data. You can see there's one column of integer values and the second column is basically P. It's a bit difficult to understand this particular information, right? But nothing to worry. We can convert this into a data frame and there's a better way of displaying the same information. Here you can see some of the movie names like Toy Story, 1995. Then you have Golden Eye. After that, you have Get Shorty, Four Rooms. Most of these are children movies, right? And you can have, you can see the rating here. Somebody has rated this as five, four, four, so on and so forth. The display is poor, I agree, but uh, we can convert this into a data frame and understand this data better. You can see here, this is what we are doing here as movie lens comma data dot frame. We are going to convert this data into a data frame. Once we are able to convert this into a data frame, we'll have a better understanding about this data set. You can see here, we have used the structure command and we are also using, we are also trying to convert this into a data frame. The number of cells here would be 99,392. These are the number of cells. These are not the number of users. We have three variables. This is a lot easier for us to understand rather than the earlier display of the data. Please look at the user. It says one, which means that we are talking about one user. There are, there are multiple records for one user because he might have rated multiple movies. This gentleman would have seen Toy Story, GoldenEye, Four Rooms, Get Shorty, and he has given the user rating. Here, as you can see, you have items and rating. This is where I'd like to again draw your attention. When you are typically building a recommendation engine, you will not have rich data. Many times people say, why can't we build clustering? Yes, we can go ahead and build clustering. But when we build clustering, you need to have rich data. You will have a lot of data about demographic details, uh, product details, purchase behavior and such things. Here, in a typical e-commerce platform, what data you will have? You will not have too much of information about demographics and such things because people are scared to share their information in an online platform. At best, you may have name, not even name, you may have a user ID and the choices that he has made, uh, what is the time duration for which he has browsed, so on and so forth. You'll have limited information. So in the face of limited information for you to make a recommendation becomes a big, big challenge. So as you can see here, there are three variables, user, the items that he has purchased, and what is the rating that he has given. So what have we done so far? Let me just quickly revise. We have loaded the package then we have gone on to load the data and we have looked at the data structure and we have converted this particular data structure as a data frame further let's keep this discussion going let's firstly do a bit of eda eda stands for exploratory data analysis to do eda what i will be doing is in line number 13 i will visualize the data i repeat in line number 13 I will be visualizing the data. We may have thousands of records, but there's no point uh, using all the thousand records. I'll be using only the first 25 records and the first 25 columns, right? This is only for the sake of clarity. This will give us some kind of a perspective as to how the data looks like visually. Let me go ahead and execute line number 14 here. Now, 
I will be showing you the output of visualization. You can see here, when you visualize the data set, you are able to see in the rows, you have 25 users. Only the first 25 users is what we are looking at. You can see here, in the rows, we are taking users. And in the columns, what we are taking is basically the movies that they are watching. You can see here, this is a scale. People can give a rating from one all the way up to five. If a person has given a rating of five, it, it is shown in darker color. If a person has given a rating of one, it is shown as a lighter shade. And if you see a person having given a rating of three, the shade is somewhere in between. That is, it is neither very dark nor very light. When you look at the very first row, it's very interesting that the first person, this first row corresponds to the first user who has seen some of the movies. There is a shading for every, rec every cell, which means that this guy has watched 25 movies. He has watched all of these 25 movies. There are certain dark color cells, which means that he has rated some of these movies highly. He has given a rating of five. And you can see here, some of these movies have received a low rating because the shade is light. Also, the same argument holds good for the rest of the 25 users as well. Wherever you see a dark color cell, it means that the value of the rating is high. Wherever you see a lighter shade, it means that this person has given a low rating for this particular movie. What is really interesting and what is really striking in this metrics is that there are a lot of empty spaces. Why are there empty spaces? Because as I already told you, you have data sparsity issue. It is empty because a person might not have rated some of these movies. Why? Simply because he might not have seen these movies and therefore these cells will be going as unrated. So this helps us get some kind of a perspective about the data that we are working on, that there is some level of sparsity problem that we have to deal with. Let's keep this uh, going. Now that we have uh, visualized the data, let's now try to examine a few records. Typically in R, what we do is we use the head command. In line number 16, we will be examining a few records. I'll be using the head function for it. You can see here the output. The output looks like this. So this is the row number. In row number 1, 453, 584, so on and so forth, you can see user number 1 has given a rating. This person we have seen earlier also, that he has seen some of these movies uh, that were made in 1995, like Toy Story, Golden Eye, four movies, Get Shorty, Copycat, and Shanghai Triad. So these are some of the movies that he has seen. And look at the rating that he has given. So for the movie Toy Story, let me just pull this particular window to the right side and execute this once again. Right. Now this helps us understand better. So the first user has seen Toy Story and he has given a rating of 5. So looks like he has liked the movie very much and therefore he has given a high rating. The second movie, GoldenEye, he's not very sure. So he's given a rating of three, which is a neutral rating. The third movie, Four Rooms, he has given a rating of four, which is not bad. He seems to like the movie, Four Rooms. The same thing can be said about Get Shorty as well as Copy Cat. He has given a very low rating. In fact, not a very low rating. He has given a moderate rating of three, which means that he has neither liked it nor disliked it. And for the final movie, that is Shanghai Triad, he has given a very high rating of five. So this guy, the user number one, he seems to have loved the movie Toy Story and Shanghai Triad. So this is what we can understand when we look at the preview of the data set using the head command. Next, the next step here would be to check the number of ratings, the number of ratings per user. Per user, we would like to check the rating. So in line number 19, 
what we are going to do is we will be checking the number of ratings per user. How do we do this? We can simply use a histogram and then use the row counts function. I'm going to color it using the red color. Let me show you the output of this particular command. Let me zoom this in and quickly show you the output. So this is how the histogram appears. Remember, in the x-axis, we have users. This is from 0 to 200. Each bar may represent a range of around 50 users. So you have roughly 50 users. They have rated approximately 400 movies. Then you have approximately anywhere in the range of 50 to 100 users. Right? They have given a rating to 200 movies. Similarly, 100 to 150 users have rated 125 movies. And lastly, what you have is 150 to 200. So anywhere in the range of 150 to 200 users have rated fewer than 100 movies. As you go to the right side, you can see here, there are very few people. There are very, very few people here. The bars are very, very short here as you move towards the extreme right side. That's what you can understand when you look at the histogram. If we come back to R Studio, we have seen the number of ratings per user. The next thing that we can do as of now is to check the number of ratings per movie. Row wise, we have checked the rating. Now, column wise, we would like to check the rating. So, in line number 22, I'll be building one more histogram. The same command, except for the fact that instead of using row counts, we are using column counts and we are passing the data set. Let me display the histogram quickly. So this is how the histogram for the movies appear. You can see here, 0 to 50 movies. Now along the x-axis, you don't have the users, you have the movies. So you have approximately 0 to 50 movies. It could be 25, 30, 40 movies in this range. There are a lot of people who have given a rating. There are at least 1,000 plus cells who have given a rating for 0 to 50. Now, as you increase the number of movies, let's say 50 to 100, of course, more number of movies, few people would have seen. Fewer movies, a lot of people would have seen. So that is a simple logic here. Few movies, when you say 0 to 50, you see a long bar implying less than 50, a lot of people have seen. But when you move from left to right, there is 50 to 100 movies, very few people would have given a rating. You have approximately 210. And as you move to the extreme right side, let's say 600 movies, 500 movies, you may not see too many people who like to, who might have watched 600 movies or 700 movies in their lifespan. So I'm back to our studio. So what we are, what we have done so far is basically to construct a histogram for users as well as for the movies. The next step in this discussion would be to look at the average user rating. When you look at the average user rating, in line number 25, let me go ahead and use this command. Histogram, row means of movie lens, color equals 2. Let me quickly display the rating. You can see here, now in the x-axis, what you have is nothing but the rating values. A person can give a rating from 1 to 5. 1 obviously means that it's a low rating. If a customer has given a rating of 5, it means that it is a high rating. You can see here in the extreme cases, that is 1 to 2, the bars are very, very short. Look at the y-axis, it is a frequency. The frequency of people who, is, who have given a very low rating is tiny. At the other extreme, people who have given a very high rating of 5 is also tiny. This is expected because, you know, users do not give extreme levels of rating. 
you know once in a decade or once in two decades you may watch a you may see a extraordinary movie like let's say a uh, let's say a movie like shole or rambo or you might watch a movie like ddlj uh, for which people may give a very high rating of 5 and at the other extreme people will not give a low rating right unless a person is having a really bad day he has lost his uh, time money Uh, and then perhaps uh, you know you are asking him to uh, he's had a terrible experience watching the movie uh, so therefore he might give a low rating otherwise for all practical purposes people may give a rating of either 3 which is an average rating or slightly above average of 4 3 to 4 is what you expect you don't see people giving very high rating or very low rating that is human psychology so for most of these uh, rating uh data you can always expect a rating value between 3 and 4 we quickly go to our studio i'm back to our studio all right now this is this could be a problem because uh, if people have most of the people at least have given a neutral rating as a data scientist you will find this very difficult because you do not know what to recommend people have neither liked the movie very much people have people also have not disliked the movie very much so if you have too many values which are clustered around the center it becomes a bit difficult because it means that people have given a neutral rating let's now proceed to look at the sample size in the data set so to use the to find out the sample size in the data set we can use the dimension command so in line number 28 we will be retrieving the number of users you can see here i'm using the dimension command and i'm pulling out the first value what is the first value the number of users so in this case the sample size is quite healthy we have a healthy user customer user a uh, database of 943 records just as you have seen the number of users let me proceed to see the number of movies how many movies are there at a overall level in line number 32 what i will be doing is i will be trying to find out the number of movies again the same dimension command so we need to get the number of dimensions 1664 these many movies are there so these 943 users what they are doing is basically they are rating 1664 movies so the total number of cells that you can expect would be the product of 943 and 1664 so you can roughly see 1569152 cells could be rated but we already saw there is huge sparsity issue so all of these 15 lakh 69000 odd cells would not have a value many of them may be blank let's now investigate the number of movies that have been rated by the users how do we do this we can simply run a summary command you can see here once you run the summary command this will give you summary of the data a minimum first quartile median then you have the mean third quartile and maximum you can see maximum number of movies is 735 so which means that there is one movie buff who has seen 735 movies very difficult i think he is uh, he's been watching a movie uh, quite often so he has gone on to rate 735 movies when you look at the minimum value it is 19 what does this 19 mean this 19 simply means that there is a the minimum number of movies that have been rated itself is 19 when you look at uh, the mean value it is 105 so it simply means that on an average people have rated 105 movies which is a good sign the median value is 64 so which means that median basically represents the 50 50th percentile so 50% of the people have rated 64 or less than 64 movies so what we are doing so far is nothing but eda or exploratory data analysis 
Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to again visualize the data. In this case, I'll be performing the visualization for a random sample of 25 records. Now, why only 25 records? Please look at the number of users. The number of users that we have is 943. We don't need a huge matrix for, of 943 by 664. It becomes a bit difficult to understand and comprehend it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out a sample of 25 users and 25 movies randomly. And I'm going to see how does the preview of the data look like. Let me quickly zoom this in. You've already seen this particular matrix, but that was for the first 25 records. This is for a random sample of 25 records. You can again see the color scaling here from one to five. If a person has given a high rating of five, it will be shown as black. On the other hand, if a person has given a low rating of one, the shade will be lighter. And if the shading is somewhere around three, you can see moderate shades, right? If the value is close to three, the user rating is close to three, you can observe a moderate shade. Now, the data sparsity issue, which I was talking about, becomes even more conspicuous here. You can see here, only few cells are populated. Most of the cells are empty. This is a clear indication that we uh, have huge sparsity problem in our hand. There are a few dark color cells, which is a good sign because this simply indicates that the customer has rated and he has given high values of rating. Let me go back to our studio quickly. Okay, I'm back in our studio. Now, let's do the next thing, which is to check how the movies have been rated. We'd like to get an understanding of how the movies have been rated in line number 42, we will be doing this. As you can see here, vector underscore rating as dot vector of movie lens at the rate of data. So we have vector ratings. Let's just look at the distribution of vector ratings. You can see here, there are a lot of zeros that you can see. This is the data set. I can see a lot of zeros, which means that these are values which have been unrated. So we see a huge domination of zero. This may cloud our judgment. If you want to see what are the unique values of rating. In our studio, in line number 46, I will be checking what are the unique values of the ratings. I'll be using unique and passing the object vector underscore rating. What you are seeing here is interesting because you can see people have given a rating of zero. This is mostly unrated or people can give anywhere between one to five. We have already seen this. It's just that we are getting this in the numerical format. Further, Let us now check out the count for each rating value, which means basically I like to see how many people have given a rating of one, how many people have given a rating of five. So we can run a table command. This will basically give you the frequency distribution. You use the table command and pass the vector ratings here. Save it as an object table ratings. Now you can see here the distribution of table rating. You can see here, these are not the number of users, but these are the cells. Approximately 14,69,760 cells have a zero rating or they are unrated. So obviously there is a huge domination of 14,69,760 cases. Remember, we had around 15,69,000 total number of cells. If you recall, out of these 15 lakh cells, 14,69,000 are blank cases. So approximately 90% of the cells that we have are blank. If you look at the value of one, which is a low rating, approximately 6,000 cells have a low rating of one. 11,000 odd cells have a rating of two. 
At the other extreme, when you look at a rating of five, 21,077 cells have a rating of five, 33,947 cells have a rating of four. Now, if you want to look at the degree of sparsity, what you can do is you can simply take the product of 943, which is the number of users, multiply it by 1664 because these many movies you have. So when you take the product of 943 multiplied by 1664, you're getting 15,69,152. Now, if I want to look at the percentage of sparsity, I can use this particular number here, which is 14,69,760. So 14,69,760, this number has to be divided by the total number of opportunities. 1569152. When you take a division, you can see here this is a massive number of 0.93, which means that 93% of the cells are blank or empty in this particular data. But this is expected because I told you that the nature of the study is that not every movie will be rated by a particular user, right? If there are 1,000 movies, I may not have watched all these 1,000 movies. So I cannot rate, rate those movies which I have not seen. So it will go as blank. Not every user will rate every movie. If you take one movie, it will not be rated by every user. So both these arguments hold good. So you can just do a 1 minus 0.93. So the percentage of data that you have is barely 7%. So what you have is barely 7%. Now, since we have a domination of 14,69,760 records, I would like to suppress this. I'd like to throw them from the data set. Let me remove these cases because they are harmful and they will cloud my judgment. How do I remove this? So in the next step, what we are going to do is we are going to repeat the same experiment of taking the count, but we are going to repeat it after removing the zero cases. You can see here, wherever the vector ratings are not equal to zero, I will consider it. So I'm going to create a new object, which is called as vector rating two. Put this vector rating two inside the table function. You can see here, table function will always give me the frequency distribution. Now, if you want to observe the distribution, this is how the distribution appears. After removing zero, you can see the frequency distribution, 6,000 odd cells have given a rating of 1, 11,000 odd cells have given a rating of 2, and at the other extreme, 33,947 cells have a rating of 4. This is a lot better. Your earlier distribution looked like this, which is slightly dangerous because of the heavy domination of the blank cells. The present distribution will look like this because we have removed the zero cases. So all this is part of data cleaning. I know that most of you may be getting impatient because we have so far not built a model. What we are doing is data cleaning. And typically when you're running a recommendation engine, 80 to 90% of your time is actually spent in data cleaning. Building model, you can do, but the data has to be in a proper format. Now, what we are going to do is we will look at some of the algorithms that are present in R. What all algorithms are present in R Studio? Let's just quickly examine this. So you can see here, we'll be checking out the available recommender algorithms. For this, I will be using a function which is called recommender registry dollar get entries, right? Data type is equal to real rating metrics. Let's see. Which all algorithms does R Studio offer? In the output window, in the console window, you can see here it displays a lot of information. We can just uh, go up and see some of the output. One is basically this is an algorithm which is called as hybrid real rating metrics. You can see here, it gives a short description wherein it says hybrid recommender 
this aggregates several recommendation strategies using weighted averages. So this is one particular algorithm that you can go ahead and use. The second very popular algorithm is what is called as ALS real rating metrics. What does ALS stand for? ALS stands for alternating least square, right? Now you can also look at the description. This is the description here. A recommender for explicit rating based on latent factors calculated by alternating least squares algorithm. So one thing that you need to remember here is that there are two forms of rating. One is what is called as explicit rating. The other one is what is called as implicit rating. So when you're, what, when you're working on rating metrics, you can have two forms, implicit rating and explicit rating. Explicit rating is a form of rating wherein the user has explicitly rated the product that he has seen based on his experience. So for example, the data that we are working on, that is movie lens data set, this is based on explicit rating because a person has given a rating of five, let's say for Toy Story, for GoldenEye, he may have given a rating of three. This is where, this is what is called as explicit rating. Many times you may not have explicit rating, you may have what is called as implicit rating. What is this implicit rating? I'll, I'll just give you an example. Let us say you have gone to a website and you have browsed this particular website. It could be, let's say, Times of India newspaper or Indian Express newspaper. Online, you have read a few articles. Now, you have not rated anything. But can I pull out the rating based on your reading habit? Yes. How do I do this? Let us say you have read the newspaper online for 60 minutes. Out of these 60 minutes, for 40 minutes, you have spent time reading about sports and Virat Kohli, right? Out of 60 minutes, that is one hour, 40 minutes you have read cricket, sports, or let's say Virat Kohli. 10 minutes you might have spent reading politics, and the remaining 10 minutes you may have spent reading about, let's say, stock market, gold price, so on and so forth. Now, nowhere have you given the rating here, but based on your behavior, it's quite obvious that since you're spending 40 minutes looking at sports and Virat Kohli, so you're a sports buff. So next time, this particular site has to make any recommendation, it is better that they make a recommendation about what Virat Kohli is doing or what is he, what are his likes and dislikes, what are his performance. Since you're a sports buff, it is obvious that you're spending majority of your time looking at sports articles. So here, it makes sense for me to do a recommendation of sports articles to you, right? Uh, you also express some kind of an interest in stock markets, prices, uh, gold prices and such things. And therefore, the next set of items which I can perhaps send to you would be in the field of uh, gold prices, stock prices, so on and so forth. So the point here is that we use ALS rating metrics when the data has explicit rating. Please don't use this when we have implicit rating. Like this, there are other algorithms also. Let me just quickly show you some of these uh, algorithms. ALS implicit re real rating metrics. We have just now discussed what is implicit real rating metrics. So you can use the ALS implicit rating metrics when the data is, when the data has implicit rating and please use ALS alternating least squares for real rating metrics when the data has explicit metrics. So there are three algorithms, hybrid algorithm, hybrid recommendation system, ALS for explicit data, ALS for implicit data. Then you have a very, very popular algorithm which is called as IBCF or item-based collaborative filtering. This is the one which is popularly used. Perhaps I'll make a separate video the next time to show you what is the difference between IBCF, that is item-based collaborative filtering. Then you also have another uh, algorithm which is called as UBCF or user-based collaborative filtering. Now, IBCF real rating metric, uh, matrix uh, algorithm you can use. Here, the input data should be in the form of IBCF for real rating metrics. So if you look at the description, it says recommender based on item-based collaborative filtering. Then you have other algorithms here as well, like LIBMF, real rating metrics. So these are all some of the algorithms that are present. You also have what is called as popular real rating metrics. Popular real rating metrics, 
recommender method popular for real rating metrics. The description that he has given is a recommender based on item popularity. So whichever is the most popular item, you can make, uh, you can sort of recommend this. Let's say laptops are the ones which are most popular. You can make a recommendation of laptops. But if a person is a sports buff and uh, you make a recommendation of a laptop, obviously that will not go well with him. So uh, these are some of the weaknesses of popular real rating metrics. So what is popular, what is trending might not necessarily be relevant. So a uh, popular real rating metrics is not such a popular algorithm. So what people tend to use is UBCF, that is user-based collaborative filtering and item-based collaborative filtering for which I'll be making separate videos. Here in this case, though we have quite a few algorithms, you can see here UBCF real rating metrics, recommender based on UBCF. So you don't need to go through every algorithm to begin with, if you're a learner, you please try to learn UBCF or IBCF. Another popular algorithm is SVDF, right? This is what is called as Funk SVD, recommender, which is based on Funk SVD. This is also a popular algorithm. Here, it is based on gradient descent algorithm. So these are some of the existing algorithms. SVD sub, uh, stands for uh, singular value decomposition, right? SVD for real rating metrics description. He has given a description recommender, which is based on SVD approximation with column mean imputation. Quite a few uh, algorithms, guys. Uh, approximately, uh, there are nine different algorithms. As I told you, the most popular would be UBCF, user-based collaborative filtering. The next one is item-based collaborative filtering. You can also learn SVD as an algorithm for recommendation. Let's now proceed to the next section. The next section would be to examine the similarity of a few users. Let's now quickly examine the similarity of a few users. In line number 63, you can see here, we'll be examining the similarity of users. We'll be using the similarity matrix. Now I'm limiting to the first four movies so that I can clearly explain. Uh, you can run this algorithm for uh, all the 1,664 movies, but you will get a gigantic matrix and it becomes difficult to clearly explain. So the for, for the purpose of clarity, I will be just using the first four records. There are different methods of similarity. Here I'm going to use a method which is called as cosine similarity. So cosine similarity you can use uh, mostly for text classification for uh, textual data or unstructured data, people prefer cosine similarity. There's another popular matrix, uh, there's another popular method of evaluating similarity, which is called as Jacquard similarity. So if cosine similarity results do not make much sense, we can change the hyperparameter here. From cosine, you can also move on to what is called as Jacquard similarity. Here, when we please uh, uh, observe that I'm specifying the argument as which equals users, which means we will be looking at the similarity of users, not of items. Please remember, you can find out the similarity between the products, or you can find out the similarity between users. In the first instance, because I'm specifying the value of the argument as users, what this does is based on the cosine similarity of users, it will construct a similarity matrix. Let me go ahead and execute this as dot similarity. So you can see here, there are four people that we are looking at. So this is a simple matrix of four by four. As I told you, you can run the same command for any number of users. So the numbers that you're seeing here represents the degree of similarity. Of course, uh, when you look at the rows, this is the first user, second user, third user, and the fourth user. Along the column also, you have first, second, third, and fourth user. What is the similarity between first and first? We are not looking at a person similarity with himself. So it is saying NA, not applicable. But we are interested in finding out the similarity of the first user with the second user. When you look at the similarity of the first and the second user, look at the value here, 0 
the value is very, very high, which means that there's a 98% similarity between the first and the second user. When you look at the similarity between the first and the third user, the similarity value is high, but it is not as high as between the first and the second. Between the first and the third user, the similarity is 91%. Between the first and the fourth user, the similarity value is 95%. So what does this mean? It simply means that the first user is most similar to the second user. So in terms of business proposition, what does this mean? This simply means that, let us say, I'm just giving an example. The first person is John and the second person is Matthew. The first person is John and the second person is Matthew. I'm just giving a simple example. Let's say John and Matthew have gone to the same school. They've passed out of the same college. More or less, they have done a PCMB and they're working in the IT field. So there is so much of similarity between them. Let's say John has purchased two items. Let's say he has purchased item A and item B. Matthew, on the other hand, has purchased C and D, right? So out of the four items, A, B, C, D, John has purchased A and B. Matthew has purchased item number C and D. John has not purchased C and D. Matthew has not purchased item A and B. So because we see from this similarity matrix that there's a great deal of similarity between these two users, you can cross-reference or cross-recommend those items that Matthew has purchased to John, which John has not already purchased, and you can also recommend the items which John has purchased, but which Matthew has not purchased to Matthew. Clearly, John has purchased only item number A and B. He has not purchased C and D. So item C and D can be recommended to John. Now look at John. So look at Matthew. Matthew has not purchased item number A and B. So you can recommend item number A and B to Matthew because John and Matthew are very, very similar, right? So this is how similarity matrix helps us. Once you understand that two people are similar, whichever items one person has bought can be recommended to the second person. Whichever items the second person has bought, but not already bought by the first person can be further recommended. Let's proceed to look at uh, item number, uh, sorry, user number two. 0.98 seems to be the highest number. So, which means that second person is more similar to the first person. Let's now look at I, uh, row number three. The this is this corresponds to user number three. The maximum value is 0.91. Then you have 0 0.96 and 0.95. So the largest value is 0 0.96, which means that the third person is similar to most similar to second person. The same funda can be used here as well. The same concept is applicable here as well. Whichever items user number two has purchased can be recommended to user number three. Let me now focus on the fourth person, 0 0.95, 0 0.96, and 0 0.95. The highest number is 0 0.96. Looks like the fourth person is also similar to the second person. So this is how a similarity matrix, this is called as a user similarity matrix because I've specified uh, which equals users based on cosine similarity. You can, of course, experiment with other methods of similarity as well. So this is a user similarity matrix that we have constructed. Now, let me proceed to create what is called as item similarity. This will give you a rich perspective about which movie is most similar to which other movie. So let me go to line number 68. In line number 68, you can examine the similarity of a few items here. Again, I'm just showing you first four records. It's easier to understand when you take a smaller data set rather than taking the entire data set. Method, I'm keeping it as it is, as cosine similarity. When it comes to which, I'm now changing this as items. So please observe here, compare the earlier method wherein I performed user similarity. Now I will be using item similarity. Now, the popular question that people ask is, should I go by user similarity metrics or item similarity metrics, which is popular that depends upon the business 
objective. But if you ask me personally, I would always choose item similarity metrics simply because item similarity metrics uh, is more stable as compared to user similarity metrics. This is simply because when a user gives a rating and you're trying to find out the closeness of rating and such things, a lot of these things are based on human perception as well, right? Now, let us say in a typical Bangalore traffic, you have uh, worked from morning to evening. Your boss has been very, very angry and you've had a terrible day at office. He has not given you a promotion. He has shouted at you for the reports that you have sent. You come home after a very hard uh, day's work. Uh, the traffic, uh, you've spent almost one and a half to two hours in traffic. You come home and you switch on, uh, uh, you switch on, uh, the, uh, you switch on the TV, uh, you find that uh, there is no power, right? You can imagine that since you've had a rough day, you are in a totally bad mood. Now, if you were to rate, you can imagine, though the movie and the product is good, you may be giving a bad rating because your mood is bad. Since you're, since the user is in a bad mood, you can expect the rating to be bad. And therefore, when you're constructing a user similarity metrics, it is subject to human emotions, it is subject to a person's perception, and therefore slightly less stable, right? So user similarity is slightly less stable. However, item similarity tends to be more stable as compared to user similarity. The second big advantage of uh, running a item similarity metrics is that item similarity metrics can handle cold start problem a lot better than user similarity. So let me go ahead and run this particular command as dot metrics. Let me pull this window to the right side. Let me rerun this once again. Yes. You can see here, we are running the item similarity metrics for four of the movies, namely Toy Story, GoldenEye, Four Rooms, and Get Shorty. Along the column also, you have the same movies, Toy Story, GoldenEye, Four Rooms, and Get Shorty. Remember that all these are children movies. So when you look at Toy Story, and the similar, when you study the similarity between Toy Story with itself, it is any, it is of course not applicable, right? You're not looking at the similarity of a movie with itself. Which movie is Toy Story very, very similar to? Let's examine this in the first row, 0 0.97, 0 0.95, and 0 0.971. The largest value, if you ask me, is GoldenEye. However, Get Shorty is also having high level of similarity. So what do we understand from this? What we understand is that the movie Toy Story is very similar to GoldenEye. It's also very similar to Get Shorty. So what is the business use for this? The business use is somebody who has seen Toy Story, you can recommend GoldenEye to him, right? The next best recommendation that you can make is Get Shorty, right? Because these movies are very, very similar. If a person has watched one movie, you can expect him to watch other movies, right? It's like, you know, action movies. If you have a series of action movies, a person has watched Rocky, Rambo, the obvious choice uh, would be to uh, recommend Arnold Schwarzenegger's movie to him. Maybe you'd like to recommend Terminator or any of these uh, action-based movies, martial art movies, Enter the Dragon kind of movies to him. Now, let's look at GoldenEye. Let's look at the highest value of uh, similarity, 0 0.97, 0 0.95, and 0 0.96. The largest value is 0 0.97. That corresponds to Toy Story. So those guys who have watched GoldenEye, you can recommend Toy Story. Four rooms, 0 0.95. That is a similarity value with Toy Story. 0 0.95, again, not applicable, and 0 0.94. So when it comes to four rooms, that has a high value of similarity with Toy Story. So if a person has watched four rooms, you would like to recommend Toy Story. The next movie that you would like to recommend is GoldenEye. When it comes to Get Shorty, look at the similarity values, 0 0.97, 0 0.96. They're very, very close to each other, 0 0.94. So you can recommend the first recommend, the first recommendation that I would like to make to a person who has watched Get Shorty would be Toy Story because this has the highest similarity value. Next movie that you would like to recommend is GoldenEye. And lastly, you might want to recommend Four Rooms.
Now here, I've taken only four values. Perhaps you can construct a giant matrix with all 1,664 movies, export this in uh, Excel and construct a matrix. You can look at the largest value or perhaps you can take this in SQL and you can pull out the maximum similarity value and based on that maximum similarity value, you can go ahead and make a recommendation to the customer. So this is how recommendation engine can be used and particularly for movie recommendation and book recommendation and such things, this becomes very, very useful. So to quickly summarize what we have done, initially, if you remember, we looked at some of the typical problems of recommendation engine, cold start problem. Then we have a data sparsity issue and long tail problem. We went on to load the package, namely recommender lab. Then we loaded the data. Further, we looked at the data structure. Remember the data structure was very clumsy. It was not in a comprehensible format. We did some visualization as part of EDA. Then we examined a few records. We checked the number of ratings per user. We checked the number of ratings per movie through a histogram. Average user rating is something which we studied. Then we were able to examine the sample size of the users. We looked at the number of movies. We further investigated by doing some visualization again. Here in line number 36, what I'm doing is basically I'm checking what is the average number of movies that have been rated? What is the maximum number of movies that have been rated? In line number 39, we are visualizing a part of the data. That is only 25 random sample I'm visualizing. In line number 42, what we are doing is basically we are checking how the movies have been rated, right? So we can convert this into a rect vector. And once you convert this into a vector, you'll be able to get the frequency distribution of the rating. Further, check what are the rating, check what are the unique values of the rating. Check the count for each rating value. If you remember, we got a big value for zero rating, right? Let me quickly plot this to see the rating matrix. I may have to do this part wherein check the unique values is fine. Table rating matrix. Okay. Table rating bar plot. You can just give a different color here just in case you want to include this as part of your ADA. You can see here, this is the slide which I did not show you. Sorry, this is the diagram. This is the graph which I did not show you. Perhaps you can uh, include this as well. You can see here the domination of zeros. Now, we don't want this. In the presence of so many unrated values, the rest of the bars will look very, very tiny. We would like to remove this. This is the one step which I did not uh, show. Let me go back to R Studio. What we did in line number 54 was to remove the zeros. And again, I, I was able to construct a bar plot after removing the zeros. Here you can construct a bar plot once again. You can check the distribution of the ratings from one to five, once again, you can see here, this is the distribution of the rating. Clearly you can see here, this is a lot better after removing zero, there is no zero here. So the rating value of three and four stands out. Then we looked at some of the algorithms. I think uh, there are at least nine different algorithms. You can experiment with different algorithms here. We constructed a user-based similarity matrix in line number 63. And in line number 68, we went on to look at the item-based similarity. So with this, I have come to the end of today's video. In future, I'd like to make 
a couple of more videos on uh, recommendation engine. Mostly I'll be focusing on how to build a model. So far we have not built a model. What we have done is simply to look at the user similarity metrics and the item similarity metrics. In future, as I mentioned, uh, I'll be making videos on collaborative filtering. There are two types of collaborative filtering, user-based collaborative filtering as well as item-based collaborative filtering. I thank you very much for watching this particular video. I request you to subscribe to my channel. Also like and share my videos. Thank you very much once again. Have a great day ahead.